Bismillah Walhamdulillah My dear sisters and my brothers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah This is your brother Abdus Salam And welcome to this new material About magic, evil eye, envy And I will also speak about the jinn Can they possess a human body Also about the messenger of Allah And his bewitching And few other points They all will gravitate around magic The reason behind this talk is a question that I received in one of the groups. The questioner says, I have a question which I have been thinking about and today is a time to ask your help. What does Allah say in the Quran about black magic, evil eye, etc.? Someone shared few hadiths in another group. This group is not uh, something that I supervise, but this is another group. And, that, and about evil eye and how to control black magic, etc. Would you kindly enlighten this issue? Can someone destroy or change our life with the help of magic? End of question. These few words, my dear sisters and my brothers, which build the body of this well-asked question. These words or this question really paint a picture and a very gloomy picture about the state of the entire Muslim world as we see it today and as it has existed in the last almost 15th century. Throughout my Islamic da'wah and teaching lives and all these things, I have been approached countless times by different people to do ruqya. And the ruqya is like the exorcists, what they do. They go to a place, they put their hand or they read Quran in some water, you drink it, that kind of stuff. I had Muslims ask me to read the Quran again, do the ruqya on them for a variety of reasons or their family or friends or things like that. If someone's wife cannot get pregnant, they are told or he is told that's because of magic or evil eye or envy. If someone's business isn't doing well, it's because of magic, evil eye or envy. If a child has nightmares and cannot sleep well, well then again it's magic, evil eye, envy or maybe they are possessed by a jinn. If someone cannot get a job, or if a girl uh, cannot get somebody to marry her, or if the wife only gives birth to girls, or, 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 or if the members of the family don't get along with each other, it's always easy to go towards magic, evil eye, envy, or maybe the jinn are inhabiting the house, and you need to clean the house, you need to kick the house uh, out of these jinns, you need to make it really. The list of the ifs is endless. People cried in front of me, begging me to read the Quran. I had people, they so much, so much desperate, put your hand on my head and just read Fatiha. And I refused to do that. They offered me big money. I even had people of prestige and power send fancy cars to my home to pick me up to go read the Quran, to do the ruqya on these people. And I declined. This question isn't an orphan question. But rather, it paints a very scary picture about the state of Muslims around the world. A picture which shouldn't have been here in the first place. It's not the fault of this questioner, really. The person who asks this question is very extremely intelligent. Especially when they put, what does Allah say about magic? If people did this, we wouldn't be here. If we always asked, what does Allah say about this? We wouldn't be here talking about sihr, evil eye or envy and things like that. Magic, evil eye, envy, the jinn possessing a human body. These are topics that the Muslim community at large around the world, they fear it. It fears these things. If I tell to somebody, tonight you're going to have some jinn in your home. When you turn the light, they'll be there looking at you with their ugly eyes. And they're going to possess you. People get scared. 
I had people with long beards and they talk religion. The moment I start speaking about the jinn and actually speaking against the jinn, they always tell me, Abdusalam, aren't you scared that one day they get mad at you and they have had enough with you and they get to you and harm you? And I look at them and I say, do you really say La ilaha illallah? Are you in the state like Nuh and the other messengers? Apart from Allah, they told their people, go ahead, harm me. Bring in whoever you will to cause me harm. Go ahead. They were not scared. And today you, Muslim, you say, La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. We all believe, every Muslim out there believes that Allah is the only one capable to create in creation. Nobody could do anything without Allah's permission, yet they get very much scared of magic, or evil eye, or envy, or that the jinn possesses them. Or if they have a child, they are scared that an evil eye will reach him, or her, or someone envious, and that they would read the Qur'an on them before the child leaves home, and they are extremely cautious and scared. Is this the state of someone who says, La ilaha illallah, they believe in Allah? Absolutely not. But that's the state we are in, and this talk will illuminate the darkness in which we live in. And once you listen to this talk, and I encourage you to listen to it two or three times, it's been long weeks in the preparation. I could have given the, an answer to this person who asked me this question. I could have answered it there and then with a few words, maybe 10, 15 minutes and end of it. But this would be just like someone who is sick and we give them one tablet from the medication. He ain't gonna do anything. So if we want something really to shake this belief and kick magic out and kick this evil eye out and the envy out and all these things, I need to cover the topic and cover it in depth. Yes, sometimes, or at least most of the time I don't give a lot of talks. I act like I'm dead, but I'm not dead. I'm writing, I'm researching, I'm, I am, I am. And then when I give a talk, it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten parts. And this makes up for all that absence. But my talks are not to inform you. My talks are here to educate, teach, and give you tools in your hands that you can turn whatever you hear from me into action. I don't entertain with information as Muslims have become today. They are the biggest consumers of religious material, and they are the least to implement what they learn. Why? Because somehow, somewhere in their psyche, Islam is just information. And now let's get a little bit into definitions of what I mean by magic. And you're going to say, hey, do you need to define magic? And I say, yes. So that you and I understand what we are talking about. And I will also speak about the evil eye and envy. And we're gonna give them definitions because somewhere when I come to the conclusion about these specific three, magic, evil eye, and envy, you are going to be extremely surprised. So let's start with the word magic. It is in Arabic, they call it sihr, and they translate it to magic. And the word sihr in Arabic means to do something very quietly and subtly. In Ramadan, when people are asleep and you wake up early morning and you start eating your food when it's dark, when you do it subtle and quietly, and we call it suhoor. Right? That's, that's what we call it, the suhoor. Even in the calendars, they put suhoor. Why? Because it just refers to a meal you're having at a time when everything is quiet and subtle. The magicians in Las Vegas, when they run a show, a magic show, to entertain people, the magician performs acts of magic to entertain the audience, of course, but he does it in a very subtle way, sometimes even in front of your eyes. And you get fooled because of that illusion. 
That is sihr and that is magic. In the dictionary, it says that magic is the use of special powers to make things happen that would usually be impossible to happen. For example, if someone breaks a glass right in front of your very eyes and you see them break the glass, something that is impossible is to get that glass rebuilt again to the same how it was before in no time. And then the magician puts a cloth on that broken glass and he goes abracadabra, whatever he says. He picks up the piece of cloth and the glass is right there and then in front of your eyes. You don't understand how the magician did that because he did it in a very quiet and subtle manner. That is Sihar. You will believe, oh my God, the glass is back again. But you don't understand. And that's that. Now imagine if I took, of course, all this is a trick, is an optical illusion, things like that. But this is what Sihar is. And if I took this person with that trick that they do, and I go somewhere in the world where people are scared of magic, and I dress this person in a very scary way of the magicians, put them in a room, and decorate the room in a way that when somebody enters that room, they get spooked. Oh my God, where am I walking into? What kind of realm am I into? And then the magician with all these incense around him and talking to them in a very deep manner. What can I do for you? And the other person gets shaky. And imagine that magician pulling the glass, breaks it, puts uh, something cloth on top of it, say a few words, and the glass is back to how we were before. Don't you think that whoever goes to visit this magician would believe that this magician has got some special powers? This is what makes people scared of, is that someone somewhere would call upon unseen creatures Oftentimes they are called the jinn or evil spirits or shaitans or devils, whatever. And then he would ask this jinn to perform certain things for him so that whoever came to visit the sorcerer will get what they wanted. If I'm madly in love with a girl and no matter what I try, she always rejects me. Instead of going and finding something else in my life to do, I go to a magician pay him money so that he devises some love potion so that when I give it to the girl or maybe gives me something when she looks at it she falls in love with me why? because he called on the jinn and the jinn did something which usually wouldn't happen and they cause it to happen with the powers they are given and then lo and behold the girl drinks from that potion or she looks at the piece of cloth or the handkerchief or she touches something and suddenly we become Romeo and Juliet. It is in this context that some hadiths say that the messenger of Allah was bewitched. The summary of this claim is that the messenger of Allah Muhammad had one day to do with a man called Labid ibn al-Asam al-Labid as they say is a Jewish man. Of course, who would we <laughs> who would we put those kind of stories on the Jews because that's the enemy of Islam number one of course that's how politics make them by now so this man this Jewish man is reported to have succeeded in ensorcelling and bewitching Muhammad the Jewish man had summoned up some evil jinn and then guess what he performed some subtle tricky quite sihric things and the prophet is magicked some of the hadiths say that the magic went for 40 days. Others, they say, six months, that 180 days. The nature of that sihr is that the messenger of Allah, Muhammad, who has the ability to, he lost the ability to remember what he did or say. In other terms, during this entire either 40 or 180 days you would think that a, a prophet that is bewitched and he and he's in going through this big agony you would think muslims would keep track of how long but no 
All this was decided over 250 years later. That's when they spoke about these things. Of course, we got all these discrepancies from 40 days to six months. And they will tell you that Muhammad would sleep with his wives, has sex intercourse with them. But he doesn't remember that. He goes to the market, buys and sells, and he doesn't remember he did that. He talks to people, promises, he doesn't remember doing that. He borrows something from somebody else, doesn't return it, but he doesn't remember that. Why? Because he's in source of this bewitched. It's strange. A great number of hadith narratives have mentioned this incredible event. And if you go to websites on the internet, not only will you find hadith narratives that will tell you that Muhammad was insulted, but they will tell you if you do not believe in that, you're not a believer, you are a kafir. You really are a kafir. The Salafi cult will not, nowadays they won't call you kafir openly. They will use some other terminologies to soften the blow. If you go, for example, to one of the most prolific uh, Wahhabi Salafi websites, IslamQA, the fatwa number is 68814. 68814. This fatwa was published on the 17th of May 2005. So it's not kind of like very old, it's recent. Someone asked the Sheikh, this very question and he said to them is the hadith about the magic on the prophet Muhammad is it authentic I have heard a lot about this now let, I took the fatwa from the English i.e. it's the I did not translate it from Arabic to English this was the answer what he's going to say is what is on the website and that's why I gave you the number and everything the Salafi the Salafi Sheikh answered he goes, the hadith of magic against the Prophet is a sahih hadith, i.e. it's true and authentic hadith. It was narrated by a Bukhari, Muslim and many other sheikhs. As far as they're concerned, this is me talking end of quote, this is, as far as they're concerned, this is an authentic hadith narrative that cannot be shaken or challenged. Then he says, quote, Ahl Sunnah i.e. the Sunni people, the scholars who follow the Sunnah. Accept this story and no one denies it except an innovator. When any, uh, no, end of quote, when any member from the Salafi cult refers to somebody else as an innovator, what they really mean is kafir. And that's why they cannot tell you you are kafir, they tell you you are an innovator. You are a misguided. You are a deviated. And then they take other hadiths which say that an innovator is kafir. He's going to end up in hellfire. Every Friday when you go to the masjid, they will tell you and stick to the book and sin of Rasulullah for every new thing is an innovation and any innovation and its inventor and follower are in hellfire. Yeah, that's how they say, refer to us. They just don't want to say it bluntly because it is a heavy term to say to somebody you are a kafir, but easy to say you are an innovator, misguided, deviated. That's it, that's, it's easy, it's easy. But anyhow, here is the text of the hadith that they use to prove that the messenger of Allah has been bewitched. They say, Aisha, the wife of Rasulullah, said, so now that Aisha said the closest person to messenger is not somebody from afar, Aisha, the closest to him, she said, a spell was put on the Prophet until he imagined that he had done a thing when he had not done it. One day, he made a dua, i.e. at the end of the 40 or the 186 months, depending on which one they go for. But anyhow, so one day he made a dua and said, so he's talking to Aisha now. Do you know that Allah has shown me 
what lies in my cure, where, lie, where my cure is. So why didn't he do it on the, f- the first day? Why didn't Allah prevent it? Why did he go until the end and then he made this dua? Only Allah knows. Then two angels came. These two angels, they morphed into two men. So now we're going to use the first man and the second man. Two men came to me and one of them sat at my head and the other one at my feet. So this is Muhammad talking. One of them said to the other, what is ailing the man? What is hurting him? What is harming him? Second man or second angel answered, he has been bewitched. The first angel said, who bewitched him? The second man... (laughs) Why I'm laughing, it really is funny. Because if these angels came to cure the prophet, they would have, because the angels, they don't come to earth from their own way. They have to be sent by somebody. I thought somebody is Allah. And their mission is specific. They know what they are going for. They know what they're going to do. They know how much time they're going to spend on earth. And then when they quit. So they go with a complete manifest of mission, what they're going to do. But here they put a Hollywood movie. The first one said, the second one said. And this reminds me of uh, uh, Paul McCartney, one of the ex-Beatles singers, when he said, uh, when he sang his song, Band on the Run. And he goes, the first one said to the second one there. But anyhow, so this is how it goes. It's, it's, it's a comical thing. But the one who lied, who conjured up this cursed hadith, put it in a manner that to force what way they believe in, in the minds of others. And they made it to this Hollywood script. The second man said he has been bewitched. The first man said, who bewitched him? The second man said, Labid ibn al-Asam, for the love of Allah. If one angel knows who did it, shouldn't the second one know? Don't they interact with each other? It's strange. Labid ibn al-Asam, a Jewish man. The first angel said, with what? And the second one said, with a comb, the hair that is stuck to it, and the skin of a pollen of a male date palm. One knows, the other one doesn't know. So what they are saying is this man, to insult the messenger of Allah, he managed to get a comb, you know, you comb your hair with, and in that comb some hair of the messenger got stuck to it and then they took a palm a tree the tree and then they went to the seed the male of that tree and that's it and this <laughs> by doing all this and he created a spell now the first man said where is it what is this sihar the second man said in the well of Darwan a well not far from al Medina then the prophet went out to the well and when he came back to Aisha said it's date palm tree are like the heads of shaitan i.e. this man Labid ibn al-Asam the Jewish man took a comb of the Rasulullah the messenger of Muhammad with some hair of it took some seeds from a male palm tree and threw them in a well and when the messenger went to get this sihr this uh, talisman guess what he looked at it and he saw that the tree's face or head looked like that of the devils Aisha said did you take it out and the messenger said, Muhammad said no Allah has healed me and I feared that it might bring evil upon the people meaning even though Allah had cured Muhammad from that particular spell the effect of that spell still persisted so Muhammad didn't want to take it out from the well why? because he was scared that the moment he takes it out from that well it would hurt and bring evil upon people and then after this incident the Prophet Muhammad ordered the other people to go and dump ground and earth and dust and it and close the well and this hadith is in Bukhari, Muslim and many others is this a messenger is this messenger of Allah reads the Quran it might bring evil upon the people and I say for this kind of idiotic lies 
It says, I, I will cover it up later on in more details, but and I promise you this, at the end of this talk, we will briefly revisit this fabricated forgery. And at that moment there, you will have your own thinking on the process. Because this hadith puts the entire Islam and the Quran in jeopardy. Yes, if Muhammad could not remember if he had slept with his wife or not. Sleeping with the wife and having an intercourse with your partner is not a fart. It's not like something you fart two seconds and it's gone. Or a scratch on your nose or removing a fly. It's a process at the end of it is an orgasm. So if Muhammad cannot remember he did this, how can he remember when he receives the Quran? When this question was raised, the scholars, they said, whoever asks this kind of question is really an enemy of Islam because Allah has protected the mind of Muhammad of the Messenger when the revelation comes down, but they didn't protect it for other mundane things of this life. Who says that? Who says that? I go to people in Al Madina and ask them to believe in a man that sleeps with his wives and doesn't remember. That is now living in a la la land. Everything about him is a miss. Yet, when he receives the Quran, we're supposed to believe him. And if you don't believe, and if you actually believe this, you cannot be a Muslim. Guess what? I'm happy not to be a Muslim the way they think. Let's go to the evil eye. Like magic, evil eye is the phenomenon which is widely believed in around the world. And I say around the world because hardly you ever go into any culture that doesn't have some sort of belief in the harmful powers of the evil eye. Around 40% of the world population believe in the evil eye. It's almost half of the world believes in evil eye. Magic, evil eye, envy, and all these things are very strongly present in places where religion is mixed with ignorance. But in the evil world, especially in the Muslim culture, we have so many hadiths that encourage this kind of belief. For example, yeah, Aisha, she says that the Messenger of Allah said, Seek refuge in Allah against the evil eye, for it is real. And this hadith is reported by Ibn Majah, Al-Hakim, and authenticated by Al-Albani. When I say Al-Hakim, it means this great scholar who one day decided to collect any other hadith that fulfills the conditions of Muslim and Al-Bukhari, and he puts it in his book. In other words, when he puts a hadith in his book, it is as good as when it is in Al-Bukhari or Muslim. In another hadith, it says, the evil eye is true, and if anything could get ahead of the decree, it is the evil eye. And if you are asked to bathe, do so. Again, this hadith is authentic by Muslim and many other scholars. Of what this hadith means is the following. If Allah had desire, had for example, for you something, that you're gonna today make a thousand pounds benefit or profit in something. So that's your decree. But someone gives you the evil eye, the evil eye will beat what Allah has written and caused it to change. Yes, that's if the evil, uh, if anything could get ahead of the decree, it is the evil eye. It means that the only one that gets ahead of the decree of Allah is the evil eye. And this is how we see how humans can put their own nose and affect the decision of the good Lord. If Allah decided today to give you a thousand pounds, someone else brings in their evil eye, it changes what Allah intended initially. Is this, is this la ilaha illallah? Does this sound to you la ilaha illallah? Not to me. And then it says something even scarier. And if you are asked to bathe, do so. Do you know why? Simple. Because in our Islamic belief, they be, of course they have authentic hadiths to, to support this from here to, to the end of the world. 
They tell you that one you evil eye a person and the other evil eye a person suffers from your evil eye. When someone comes to you and asks you to take a shower or a bath and then they take the water, your water and they go dump it on the other person as a cure. That's why they say, and if you ask to bathe, do so. And there are hadiths that mention that somebody was evil-eyed by somebody else and the Prophet asked the other person to take a bath and they took his uh, water and they dumped on the uh, evil-eyed one and then they woke up all fresh as if nothing happened to them. You might think, I don't believe in evil eye. Well, guess what? You do, if you don't believe in it, you are acting it. That is how. In another hadith, an authentic hadith by Ahmed, who is the teacher of Bukhari Muslim, Ibn Majah, who is the student of Ahmed, a Bukhari Muslim, Malik, and a few others, and Al-Albani authenticated this hadith, which means the Salafi world, the Sunni world, the Shia world, everybody believes in this as they would believe in the Quran, if not more. They say, if one of you sees something in himself, or his wealth or his brother that he likes. Let him bless it and ask for barakah from Allah for the evil eye is real. Strange, isn't it? Well, there is another hadith which points people to what to say when they see something that they like about themselves or in somebody else. And if a person sees something that he or she likes and fears envy or evil eye, okay, Messenger of Allah, what should we do? He says, or the hadith says, he should say, Masha Allah, Tabarak Allah, so that the thing looked at will not be affected by the evil eye. Let me ask you this. Have you ever found yourself in a group of people and when they see a child, when they see something, the first thing they say, Masha Allah, oh, what a beautiful thing, Masha. Do you know why they say Masha Allah? Because they're scared of the evil eye. Yes. So even if you don't believe in it, you still find yourself saying it. Sometimes someone brings their child to you, a newborn baby, and they give it to you. And if you don't say, inshallah, they will tell you, say inshallah. Why? Because they're scared of the ayn, the evil eye. So in conclusion, what are people scared of is that someone looks, at the, the, looks with their eyes to something with the intent of harming that thing there. And I don't know what happens in the atmosphere or somewhere in the air. And suddenly pain and harm and destruction reaches the person. In our books, the sad thing is they use the Qur'an to support this false argument. And they bring an ayah in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Qalam, this is Surah number 68, in the ayah 51. They say that Allah says, وَإِيَّكَادُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَيُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ And those who disbelieve would almost strike you down with their looks, glancing at you. When they heard the Quran and they would say he certainly is a madman. The sheikhs and the Islamic institution would go, you see, you see, the evil eye is true. Look at the disbelievers who use their glasses to wish to harm the messenger. And I say, if that is true, why didn't their evil eye work? The entire city of Mecca hated the Prophet. They hated him from, with, 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 with passion. And if the evil eye worked, why didn't they harm him? Why? That's one thing. But what Allah is saying is really simple. Allah is talking to us about a physical interaction. What we call it a body language. You see, when you focus your eyes on somebody, you can use it. For example, if you are in a moment of love and passion, when you stare at somebody, it communicates a different message. When you are angry at somebody and you stare at them, your eyes convey another different message. When you are puzzled by something, 
your eyes will and that's why we call a body language what Allah is saying here is simple that the kuffar the disbelievers of Mecca hated Muhammad and the message he brought so much that if they could harm him just by looking at him they would have done it but they can't because the eyes do not harm all Allah is doing is describing a very normal hate expression through dirty looks. That's, that's, that's the end of it. But the sheikhs, of course, they want to force the concept of evil eye on us or Muslims. And they distorted the Quran and today we are praying the price for that. So again, magic is when someone does something you don't know what it is and they do it quietly subtly and they summon up some jinn to get a result evil eye you, you 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 just look at something with some ill intent inside you and something is supposed to happen guess what what is envy then well envy is an emotion which occurs when a person doesn't have or is not superior as the other person and they would wish for the whatever the other person has to go but this is just like an evil eye isn't it but evil eye is just they want it gone from you but envy they said is they want what you got so that's what differentiates the two evil eye i harm you for the sake of harm the envy i harm you and i want what you got aristotle the great philosopher has defined envy as the pain at the sight of another's good fortune. That's it. And he says then it is stared by those who have what we ought to have. How nicely done. Thank you, Mr. Aristotle. Thank you very much. In the Arabic term is called al-hasad. And people get scared from this. And they read Quran. And I will tell you, <laughs> I will tell you something that Muslims do, and of course they put that on the Sunnah every single day, because they are scared of magic, evil eye, and hasad. When you finish your salat, if you are praying the five daily prayers, they always tell you as soon as you finish, you do your dhikr. You sit down, you say a few words, and then you say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, and then you read Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Farqa, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas. Don't they say that? And you read this three times in the morning, three times after Maghrib, right? Do you know why? Because you protect yourself from magic, evil eye, and envy. So you see how they play the trick? So we are scared on a daily basis because of this magic, evil eye, and envy. They bring in few hadiths about envy. They tell you the messenger of Allah said, do not envy each other. And they say it's authentic hadith. It's in Bukhari and Muslim. In another hadith, again, by same thing, by Abu Hurairah, they will tell you that the messenger of Allah has advised us to avoid envy for envy devours good deeds just as fire devours firewood. So this hadith is by Abu Dawood and Al-Bayhaqi and others. The scholars debate, is it authentic, is it not authentic? And then they said, you know what, we don't care if it's authentic or not. All we care about is that you must not envy each other. And if you do it, envy will eat your good deeds just as fire eats wood. Very dangerously enough, there is another hadith that has caused a lot of grief between scholars. And the scary thing of the, all this is that the Salafis won the argument. And you're going to say, and, and I'll tell you, according to Salafis, a lot of us are kuffar, many of us. Why? Because they say the Messenger of Allah said, لا يجتمع في جوف عبد الإيمان والحسد. Two cannot coexist in the heart of a person. And what are they? It means it's either the one or the other, right? What are they, Messenger of Allah? It's the belief, the faith and envy. Yes, this hadith has caused a huge problem for the sheikhs. Because this hadith specifies clearly that a Muslim cannot be a Muslim if they envy. And this is a very dangerous thing. 
Because when Allah spoke about envy, al-hasad in al-Quran, he didn't mean when someone sits at home and wishes what you get for themselves. You know what? Sometimes I'm home and I see somebody in California. And I love California. I cherish my time that I spend there studying and working. When I see someone in Hollywood or someone in San Francisco, you know how much I would love to be in their place? That's envy. It means at that very particular moment, I am not a believer. If you see someone in the streets, they have the latest phone, the latest car, they have tons of money. And you would wish that, guess what? You cannot be a believer. Why? Because you are wishing for what the others have and you want it for yourself. And that and your faith cannot coexist in your heart. Al-Hasad. Envy has been mentioned in the Quran four different places. Four different. Let me pick up two of them so that you know what Allah talks about. And it applies to the all four. For example. Allah talking about certain group of people from the people of the book in al Madina, who had wished that Allah would send a messenger from the people of the book, i.e. from the Jews. But it didn't happen. So they really didn't like match that. And because of that, they did certain things that Allah called Al-Hasad. For example, Allah says, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا حَسَدًا مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ This is Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, the Ayah 109. Many of the people of the book would love to turn you, i.e. away from Islam, after you have believed. And then Allah says, and that is done out of envy from themselves. We can see here, my dear sisters and members, that the people of the book felt envious because Allah had descended on the believers, on the Arabs, what he didn't descend on them. And he sent a messenger from the children of Ishmael, not Isaac. So they got really, they felt better and they felt envious that. And then what did they do? They didn't go and sit in their tribe and look at the Muslims and envy in them until the cows come home. No. They turned that envy into an action. And that action is turning the believers into non-believers. Hasad or envy in the Quran is a feeling of jealousy combined with evil actions to take away what the other person has. That is the hasad. So, me looking at somebody in California and wishing I was there, that is not hasad. But me seeing somebody going to California, and I want to be the one going to California, not them, then I go and tear their plane ticket and hide their passport. That is hasad, because I turned my wishes into evil actions. That is hasad. It never was just somebody looks at wishes what you get. For example, in Surah, this is the second example, Surah 113, that's 113. It's a very well Surah, known Surah, almost everybody knows it. We recite it, uh, they recite it after the, the, the Salat, as I said. They recite it at night before they sleep. They read it on themselves, they read it on their kids. They, oh, oh. And it is, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسق إذا وقب ومن شر النفاثات في العقد ومن شر حاسد إذا حسد It's a total agreement between the sheikhs that this surah contains two duas to ask Allah to protect us from magic and envy and they are so so wrong the ayah are translated the meanings do say Allah orders Muhammad and anyone who reads the Quran to say the following I seek safeguard or refuge as they call it with the Lord of the dawn al-falaq is the dawn is when Allah separates two elements from each other and here in this surah Allah is chosen to be the Lord of the dawn the light and not the Lord of Darkness, and this is important. I say, say, I seek refuge in the Lord of Light. 
From what do I say? Well, min sharri ma khalaq. From the evil of whatever he created. You see, Allah creates evil. Anything on earth is creation of Allah. But it is the humans who choose to use that evil. For example, creating a knife is a creation of Allah. So when someone picks up a knife and kills somebody with a knife, we can't blame Allah for doing that because a knife can also be used to cut a nice cake at a birthday or to cut the umbilical cord when a baby is born. So there are some good news in using that. But when the humans follow the Lord of Darkness, the Shaitan, and they misuse what Allah has created, that element turns into evil. So the same thing for drugs, for anything that is out there. The intent of it is for good. Humans do bad with it. A baseball bat, the intent of it is to play a nice sport. Baseball competition and people are happy but when someone picks up the baseball bat and hits somebody else on the head and kills them well they have ta they have taken the evil from the baseball bat and used it against the other person anything on earth is equally for good or evil so when somebody takes something that is good and takes the evil from it that's what we are seeking protection against so from the evil, from whatever Allah created, i.e. from the evil that humans deduct or use from whatever good Allah created. Because Allah will not create something to harm humans just for harming them. Even drugs, cocaine, heroin and all these drugs. It's humans who mix up these chemicals and they create this murderous uh, thing. But here, morphine, we use it for medication. When you have some surgery, when you have some uh, tough accidents and you need to control pain, yet you find other people who use morphine to get high and harm themselves. So this is what Allah means when he says, min sharri ma khalaq, i.e. from the evil of what a human take from the good that Allah has created. Carry on. And from the mischief of night when it darkens. We all know the night is not dark. The hours of the night are not equally dark. At the beginning it's not very dark and at the end it's not very dark. And the closer we get to the middle of the night, closer we get to the darkens of the darken. And that is when usually thieves, crimes happen. Is when people have set in for the night to sleep and the night is extremely dark and people then go and do evil things you see if someone wants to to rob a store they come in the middle of the night it already is dark and they wear something dark and they walk in and then they are very hard to see daytime everybody will see them so what we are asking is Allah to protect us from the mischief that takes place when the night darkens very well and then من شر النفاثات في العقد and here is one of the biggest mistakes they tell you and you also ask protection in Allah from the evil of the sorcerers who blow upon nuts or magicians who blow into nuts to harm others this is the general translation really but is this what Allah says? absolutely not but why does this explanation exist? Simple. Because whoever explained it came to it with the presumption of a belief. They already held a belief and they looked in the Quran for something to justify their belief. And oftentimes they are so, so wrong. In this Min Sharri Nafathati Fil Uqad, which is number four, when you look. I use different websites to check translations and just uh, sometimes it helps me, sometimes it just makes me uh, go mad, sometimes it makes me laugh, sometimes I scratch my head. How did they get there? But that's what it is. When they came to Min Sharri Nafathati Fil Uqad, what they did, they took what the sheikhs of the past had said and they translated the meanings of what the people have said, not what Allah says. They tell you, and from the evil of those witches casting spells by blowing into knots or onto knots. 
I, uh, which woman, which or sorcerer would take a knot and then she makes, uh, sorry, uh, would take a rope and she makes a knot or she ties two elements, pieces of clothes and as she does that, she blows on them and she reads bad spells and that's how magic takes place. And, the, and in another translation from the evil of the sorceresses who blow upon knots in another one, and I seek refuge from the devils of the sorceresses who blow onto nuts. Another one says, and from the evil of the blowers in nuts. And in, in Arabic it's feminine, so it's got to be something feminine there. And from the evil of the women who blow into nuts or onto nuts, and the harm of witches. So you see, it all goes around, evolves around women. Which means, this ayah, since it's just talking about women, it doesn't talk about men, right? But that is not how the Qur'an works. It really doesn't. If Allah wants to talk to women, He addresses them and it's clear. If Allah wants to talk to men, He addresses them and He makes it clear. And when He wants to talk to both, he uses expressions that both the male and the female understand and he makes it clear. So what does ayah number four mean? Min sharrin fi al It really is simple. What Allah is saying is this. We ask Allah refuge from any person who goes around and blows evil into any kinds of relationship that exists out there. For example, you're going to do a business deal. You're going to sign a contract tomorrow. And I, your competitor, have heard of that. And then I go spread rumors. I do everything in my powers so that you don't get the contract. This ayah applies to me. If some, so anyone who doesn't want somebody else to get whatever contract they do in a relationship and that the, that person would go and do everything in their power so the other person doesn't end up with a contract or with anything that is what Allah is asking us to seek refuge uh, against not women who blows into nuts and then Allah says وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ and from the evil of an inferior when or if they envy and this ayah is peculiar so Allah is asking us to seek the Lord of the light to ask him so that we seek refuge in him from an envier who's sitting at home and just envies think about me oh I wish he doesn't have that also if you have a Maserati or if you have a Lamborghini I'm sitting here and envying you to death Oh yeah, Allah, I want that Maserati, I want that Lamborghini, I don't want them to have it. I have all the jealousy in my heart. Oh, I want my jealousy. Come on, come on, come on, work, work, go, 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 do something to them, right? <laughs> it's a joke. What Allah is stating here is this. And we seek refuge in you, Ya Allah, from the evil of someone who wants what we got and goes around and does evil to us to get what we have. That is what, what Allah is asking us. And that is the Lord of the light. Anyhow, before I get on further, I think I should stop here and go to part two. Because then we are going to speak about... Uh, anyhow, in part two, inshallah, we carry on with this uh, thing. Now you have a pretty good idea about what magic is, what evil eye is, and what the envy is. If, uh, magic is when you play some tricks in a very subtle way to get your result. Here people go to a magician and as I said, they wa I want to put a love spell. You know what? I want to put a love spell on him who is now the cutest, sexiest, richest, famous actress. I don't follow much, but uh, I don't know. Who do I pick? Let's say I'm going to pick X. I don't know who she is. So now I'm going to go to a sorcerer and I'm going to tell him, you know what? I cannot sleep. I want to marry that one. Would you please put a spell on her? He goes, sure. And then he goes in that uh, environment of his, do some things, and then he comes a potion to me and he goes, have this to her and she'll be your wife tomorrow. And you go, yay! How much do I owe you? 200 pounds. Oh, dollars or pounds or whatever currency. And I go. So that's magic. 
And of course him, he would have called on Satan, Shaitan, the devils to help him. And then the Shaitan go behind the scene and they start working their evil magic. And before you know it, Abdul Salam is a celebrity now because I married the one I wanted. Yay! <laughs> this is magic. Only an idiot believes in this kind of things. Evil eye, you see something and suddenly a machine inside you gets with all the negativity and you want to harm the other person. And some kind of like a, a deadly arrows leave your heart and your eyes unseen ones and they go and they start attacking the other person and then the other person falls. A beautiful girl is walking and then she trips, almost fell and she goes, oh my God, this is the product of an evil eye. Alhamdulillah, it came like this, it didn't hurt much. Without knowing, she committed shirk. And you, you buy a car and you are scared that people are going to envy you and evil eye you. And you spend hours and you read Quran in it and you get totally scared. That's an act of shirk. And you will see why in the other parts. I let you go now, inshallah, and off to part two. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And this is again your brother, Abdul Salam.